Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hey, before we start the show today, I want to tell you about something brand new we're launching with our friends at Apple Podcasts called The Ongoing History of New Music Unlimited. For $3.49 a month, $3.49, which is less than the price of your morning coffee, you can now get access to the full archive of our shows ad-free. Plus, you'll get brand new episodes two days early and special bonus episodes. It's Ongoing History Unlimited, and it's available right now only on Apple Podcasts. We've all heard stories about where punk came from. The New York Dolls and a few other bands started playing in a crappy area of New York City in the early 1970s, an area that attracted musicians, artists, and various degenerates with promises of low rent. This leads to the opening of CBGB, a club that becomes the center of a music scene that gave home to bands like Television and Blondie, The Talking Heads, The Heartbreakers, and most importantly, The Ramones. In July 1976, the Ramones fly to London and play a show attended by curious kids who then either continue on with their punk plans, that would be the Sex Pistols, The Clash, and a few others, or inspire others to form their own punk groups. And from there, punk spreads across the world. So that's a nice, succinct look at punk's origin story. What's missing is Canada's involvement. And believe me, the Great White North had a lot to say about punk in those early days. And I mean a lot. Toronto was like the third leg of a punk triangle that extended to New York on one side and London on the other. Ideas and trends and music was constantly being exchanged. Meanwhile, out on the West Coast, there was a fierce Vancouver scene that worked mostly along north-south routes into the United States. And then across the country, there were pockets of punk that had their own influence. This history needs to be told. And we're going to do it by looking at the stories of 14 incredibly important punk bands from back in the day. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and prepare yourself for a lot of old school punk rock. But unlike other histories that focus on New York and London, maybe LA and California, we're going to give props to Canadian punk pioneers. When the original stories of punk were written, Canadian acts were largely left out of the story. And that's just wrong. This needs to be fixed. And to do that, we're going to highlight the contributions of 14 bands who helped establish punk, move it forward, and thus add incredible richness to the Canadian music scene. The first band on our list is one of the groups that started it all in the country, Teenage Head. It's worth noting that they were formed just months after the Ramones made their debut and were playing gigs before the Sex Pistols and The Clash came together. Their first show was on October 17, 1975, at Westdale High School in the West End of Hamilton. The Pistols did not play their first gig until three weeks later. The Clash did not play live until July 1976. Teenage Head was a major part of the original punk scene in Canada. They were kind of like the Ramones, kind of like the New York Dolls, and kind of like some of the more sneery sides of 50s rock and roll. Between 1978 and 1980, they got bigger and bigger and bigger, culminating with the infamous riots at Ontario Place in Toronto. Thousands of people tried to get into a sold-out show, and it did not end well. Still, talk about publicity. Meanwhile, American radio programmers who liked the band's music were uncomfortable with the name Teenage Head for, um, well, you can guess, even though the band was named after a song by a group called the Flame and Groovies. Anyway, this resulted in a name change to Teenage Heads, at least for America. In September 1980, the band was set to play some showcase gigs stateside in hopes that they could turn their Canadian notoriety into something bigger. But just before they were supposed to leave, guitarist Gord Lewis was in a terrible car accident, and the showcase gigs were canceled. Gord recovered, but by then the window had closed. Teenage Head soldiered on in Canada, sometimes hanging out with their friends from the Ramones and the New York Dolls. Original lead singer Frankie Venom died of throat cancer in 2008, but the band continues today with Dave Rave on vocals. More than 40 years after that first show, and long after most of their original punk rock contemporaries called it quits or died off, Teenage Head is still with us. Now, 
While Teenage Head was pretty intense for their day, if you get the chance, check out a film called The Last Pogo for how crazy Toronto punk rock could get. The Vile Tones were probably a couple of clicks higher. They were formed in Toronto in December 1976, just as British punk was finding an audience in North America. Although the dates are fuzzy, those who would become the Vile Tones were certainly on hand when the Ramones played their first Toronto gig on September 26, 1976. Every respectable punk and wannabe punk was at that show. The Vile Tones were more of a Sex Pistols and Stooges thing, and frontman Steve Nazi Dog Lucky was on a mission to become as dangerous as Iggy Pop. If you didn't want to get hurt, you did not stand down front at a Vile Tone show, lest you get whacked by the dog. It's possible that the Vile Tones were the first Canadian band to release something on vinyl. This is hard to tell because we really don't know the exact date, just that a three-track, seven-inch single appeared in May 1977, around the same time they made their live debut at the Colonial Tavern. It would have been after the Sex Pistols released Anarchy in the UK, but before God Save the Queen came out. The Damned, the British band credited as being the first punk group anywhere to release a single, only had two singles up by the time this song was released. And the Ramones... Well, they only had three singles available by this time. So, yeah, this this was groundbreaking. The track is called Scream Fist. The Vile Tones, featuring Steve, Nazi Dog, or just the dog, Lucky, Freddie Pompey, Chris Haight, and Mike Anderson with Screaming Fist from May 1977. If you're a fan of sci-fi writer William Gibson, you've probably read his 1984 book, Neuromancer. In it, there's an organization called Operation Screaming Fist, which is meant to attack Soviet computer infrastructure. And that operation is named after the Vile Tone song. Gibson was also the person who first coined the term cyberspace. That was two years earlier. But it was through Neuromancer that the word was popularized to what it's become today. The Vile Tones officially still exist, but the only original member is Steve. Haven't heard much from them lately. The other Canadian band that might have been the first to release a single is the Diodes. They were formed at around the same time as the Vile Tones, which would be late 1976. Members were also at that first Ramones gig in September. The Diodes' first show was opening for the Talking Heads in January 1977. That summer, they founded Crash and Burn at 15 Duncan Street, the first punk-only club in Canada. It was a hole, and really nothing more than the band's rehearsal space in downtown Toronto. A ton of young punk bands from Canada and the U.S. played there over the few months that it was open. It didn't make it until the fall because upstairs, the Liberal Party of Canada had an office, and they kept complaining to the landlords about the noise and the weird people hanging around outside. The Diode's first recording is said to have appeared in the spring of 1977, but not released until later in the summer. It was an indie thing on their own Crash and Burn label that wasn't very musical, but instead it was a performance art thing that wasn't even properly credited as a Diode's record. If you can find a copy of this today, expect to pay about 400 bucks. The Diode's were certainly the first Canadian band to sign with a major label. That deal came in August of 1977 and their self-titled debut album appears in October. This would have been a single resulting from that deal. The Diodes from 1977 and the start of a string of singles and albums. They broke up for the first time in 1982 but have reunited a bunch of times in the following decades, and they're still very active online. Still in Toronto, we have to mention the B-Girls. They might have been the first all-female Canadian punk band. Or maybe not. We'll we'll get to that. But the B-Girls were a fixture on the scene during that first wave of punk in the 1970s. They hung with and opened shows for Teenage Head and the Vile Tones and eventually The Clash. The B-Girls came together in 1977 and their attitude and look was very punk, although they sounded a lot like some of the British invasion groups of the middle 1960s. Records were released in Europe, and after relocating to New York, they became friends with Blondie and the Ramones and the Cramps and the Dead Boys and the rest of that crew. 
Members ended up singing background vocals on Blondie's Auto American album in 1980. And they had demos produced by both Debbie Harry of Blondie and Mick Jones of The Clash. They almost scored a record deal with IRS, but the label decided to go with some L.A. group called The Go-Go's instead. And by the way, The Go-Go's were huge fans of the B-Girls. No album was ever released while they were together. That lineup fell apart and they were done by 1981. Still, though, they made their mark. And this Canadian punk band influenced not just Blondie and the Go-Go's, but a band visiting New York from Georgia called the B-52s. So, not bad, right? Here's a sample of the B-Girls playing at CBGB in New York. This is called Fun at the Beach. The B-Girls with Fun at the Beach, live at CBGB. One more Toronto area band from that first wave of punk, and there's a connection to the B-Girls. At one point, the Demics, a band from London, Ontario, featured a drummer named Marcy Satty. She would later leave and become part of the B-Girls. The Demics came together in 1977 and regularly traveled the 401 to be part of what was happening in Toronto. In the fall of 1978, they recorded an EP called Talks Cheap for a Toronto-based indie label called Ready Records. There was also an album in 1980, but not long after that, the band was finished. They have, however, left behind this song. Remember at the beginning when I said that Toronto was a leg in the punk triangle that extended to London, England in one direction and New York City in the other? This is a song about those Toronto bands, the Vile Tones, the B-Girls, the Curse, the Dios, and so many others that would regularly drive the nine hours to New York to play and then couch surf with anyone who would have them. The Demix and a genuine Canadian punk rock classic, New York City from 1979 and the EP Talks Cheap. One more Toronto band, and they are The Curse. They are contenders with the B-Girls for being the very first all-female Canadian punk band. They were ready to play live as early as May 1977. By the following month, they were part of that caravan heading to play CBGB in New York. Their first such show was an all-Canadian bill that also featured the Vile Tones, the Diodes, and Teenage Head. They were far more intense than the B-Girls. Mickey Skin, one of the members, liked to wear a fake lobotomy scar on her head, and they were intent on destroying the patriarchy of music. Very feminist, these people. They also liked to start food fights at their shows. Mickey, for example, liked to pull hot dogs out of her pants and then throw them at the audience. Their biggest song was also their most controversial. In the summer of 1977, a 12-year-old boy named Emmanuel Jacques, a kid seen shining shoes on Young Street, was offered 35 bucks by three guys to help move some photographic equipment. Instead, he was tortured and raped for 12 hours before he was strangled and drowned in a kitchen sink. His body was found wrapped in plastic under a pile of wood on the roof of a massage parlor called Charlie's Angels. The torture had gone down in an apartment above the massage parlor. It was one of the most shocking crimes Toronto or Canada had ever seen and was the catalyst for the city to clean up the seediest parts of downtown. The curse seized on the incident to write this song, and it's called Shoeshine Boy. The curse with Shoeshine Boy from 1977. Were they the first all-female Canadian punk rock band? Maybe, but the B-Girls and a group from Vancouver might want to talk to them about that. That's where we're going next, to the West Coast, a place with its own influential punk rock scene. This is some deep history, a look at 14 Canadian punk bands who helped punk become what it is, not just in Canada, but around the world. We're going to talk about Vancouver, and we need to start with DOA. They evolved out of a punk band called The Skulls, who were around by 1977. They tried to make the move to Toronto, but that didn't work out, and they broke up. One of their number, Joey Keithley, moved back to the West Coast and started a new band. At the time, they had a singer who went by the name of Harry Homo, 
He's the one who suggested that this new band be called DOA. Their first gig was on February 20th, 1978, at a place called the Japanese Hall. Harry Homo was immediately fired because he was awful. Joey Keithley took his place and has been DOA singer ever since. Their first single, Disco Sucks, recorded using money from the band's pooled unemployment checks, came out in the summer of 1978. It was part of a four-track EP on the band's own Sudden Death Records. That record did surprisingly well in cities with punk scenes and on college radio, so it was time to branch out. However, the Rocky Mountains can be a problem. They make east-west touring difficult. So DOA's tour route was down the west coast to L.A. and then east from there. This was all done on the super cheap. But DOA helped create an international punk community by compiling a list of punk-friendly places to play and places to stay across the continent. The list, as some called it, was shared amongst dozens, maybe hundreds of bands who used it to tour North America. And that went a long way to establishing punk across the continent. DOA toured constantly and would play anywhere, no matter how small the town. And in the process, the list grew and grew and grew. And that was one of DOA's biggest contributions. The other came in 1981, when they released an album called Hardcore 81. That title, and the tour behind it, is credited as giving this new type of very fast, very hard, very heavy, very aggressive punk rock its name. Hardcore. Here's a sample from that record. It's called My Old Man's a Bum. Vancouver's DNA, still around today, still running Sudden Death Records. Call them the fathers of hardcore punk. I mentioned earlier about Canada's first all-female punk band, and as far as we can tell, that honor goes to a Vancouver group called the Dish Rags, or more correctly, as they were first known, Dee Dee and the Dish Rags. They're actually from Victoria and were jamming as early as 1976. The three members were around 15 at the time, and were early fans of the Ramones. Dee Dee and the Dish Rags were part of Vancouver's first punk rock show on July 30th, 1977, in front of about 400 people, which was a lot for that time. The band didn't last long. They were done by 1980, but they managed two EPs, and their best-known song was probably this one. It's just over a minute and a half, but uh, it gets the job done. This is called I Don't Love You. The Dish Rags, most likely, we think, Canada's first all-female punk band. And if we look at the dates, one of the first all-female punk bands anywhere in the world. Still in Vancouver, we have the k -Tels. That was their original name. But they soon became known as Young Canadians because, uh, well, the company, k -Tel, that sold cheap records, they, uh, they threatened legal action. They came together in 1978 and lasted two years. And out front was Art Bergman, a guy who still figures on the Canadian alt-rock scene. The band never committed a ton of stuff to record. Money was tight and discipline wasn't exactly their forte. But they did win a local battle of the band's contest, which got them some studio time at a new facility called Little Mountain Sound. The engineer assigned to them, these contest winners, was some kid named Bob Rock. He would soon be in a band called the Paolas, and then he would go on to be one of the biggest record producers on the planet. Metallica, Motley Crue, Bon Jovi, The Cult, Tragically Hip, and dozens of others. In fact, this song from the Hey, We Won the Contest session was the first time Bob Rock ever produced something. The song is called Hawaii, and it's from Young Canadians. Let's go to Young Canadians and Hawaii, produced by Bob Rock with Art Bergman on vocals. And by the way, Art contributed so much to the Canadian punk music scene that he was made a member of the Order of Canada in 2020. Next, we have the Subhumans. And I, um, 
I don't even know where to begin. They were formed in Vancouver in 1978 and were easily one of the most political and activist bands the country has ever seen. We had four guys, Useless, Dimwit, Wimpy, and Normal. That was the original lineup. In 1981, Useless, whose real name is Jerry Hanna, quit the band and fell in with a group called Direct Action. They were out to change the world by any means necessary. They were also known as the Vancouver Five and sometimes the Squamish Five. On October 14, 1982, this group bombed a plant owned by Lytton Industries, a Toronto company that made guidance systems for cruise missiles. No one was killed, but several workers at the plant, as well as three cops, were injured, some seriously. Now, we must make it clear that Hannah was not part of that bombing, but he did support it. And yes, he was involved in plans to rob a Brinks truck with some stolen automatic weapons to help finance other actions. Three porn stores were targeted, an electrical substation, maybe a few others. He was eventually arrested. However, his arrest served to bring the punk rock community together with plenty of bands and fans attending benefits to raise money for a proper lawyer. Everyone was afraid he wasn't going to get a fair trial. But he was still convicted and sent to jail for 10 years, serving five before he was released. While Hannah was in jail, the band, the Subhumans, carried on. And the publicity from his arrest and trial did a lot to heighten awareness of punk across the country. That was nice, but not exactly the best way to get publicity. You know what I mean? This is from 1980. It's the Subhumans from an album entitled Incorrect Thoughts. The song is Urban Gorilla. The Subhumans and Urban Gorilla from 1980. One more essential Vancouver punk band from back in the day called The Pointed Sticks. They started up in 1978, consisting of fans of British-style punk. A little more on the power pop side, if we're honest. Lots of melodies and all five guys singing harmonies, which was unusual. There were a few crossover members from DOA and The Subhumans, too. They had a sense of humor. Their name comes from a Monty Python skit called Self-defense against fresh fruit. You promised we wouldn't do fruit this week. What do you mean? Well, we've done fresh fruit for the last nine weeks. What's wrong with fruit? You th- you know it all, eh? Oh, can't we try something else? Like someone who attacks you with a pointed stick. Pointed stick? Oh, oh, oh. We want to learn how to defend ourselves against pointed sticks, do we? Getting all high and mighty, eh? The Pointed Sticks became the first Canadian band to sign to Stiff Records, one of the groundbreaking indie labels in the UK. They had The Damned and Nick Lowe and Elvis Costello and Ian Jury. There were several solid singles and one album, and because they were less scary than some of the other Vancouver punk bands, they were able to attract a slightly different audience, something that broadened the scene for everyone. Here's a track from them called The Marching Song. Vancouver's Pointed Sticks with The Marching Song. So far, we've covered 10 essential Canadian punk rock bands. I have four more to tell you about. Hang on. The name of this program is 14 Essential Canadian Punk Rock Bands. We're going back to the 70s and 80s for a look at some groups who contributed to the growth of punk rock, not just in this country, but in the U.S. and around the world. So far, we've focused mainly on just Toronto and Vancouver, but we need to fill in a few blanks in between, starting with the Forgotten Rebels. Like Teenage Head, they came out of Hamilton in 1977. This was about 18 months after Teenage Head was formed. They were led by vocalist Mickey DeSatist. He was joined by a bunch of like-minded people who thought what was happening with British punk was the best, although they had a certain soft spot for New York bands like the Ramones and the Dead Boys as well. They were sarcastic and sometimes profane. They had songs like Surfing on Heroin, Bomb the Boats and Feed the Fish. That was a horrible look at Vietnamese refugees. No Beatles reunion was, uh, well, that song speaks for itself. And then there was Reich and Roll that made some people angry. They were alternatively called anti-Semitic and homophobic. But the band maintained that this was all satire, or at least their idea of it. And they sometimes attracted a couple thousand people to a gig. 
Their first release was a six-song indie cassette called Burn the Flag in 1978, followed by a 19-track record called Tomorrow Belongs to Us. This song appears on both. It's called I'm in Love with the System. Despite being controversial, or more probably because of it, the Forgotten Rebels had a large cult following, although they were never really embraced to the level of Teenage Head. The band is still together in some form, with Mickey DeSadist being the only original member. Let's head to Edmonton now. The city wasn't exactly what you'd call a punk capital, but the city did birth SNFU, a hardcore band that started in 1981 and should be recognized as one of the first groups to influence what would later be known as skate punk. They were led by vocalist Mr. Chi Pig, the stage name of Ken Chin. He was the second youngest of 12 children who all grew up poor. And according to legend, the Chin family was the last family in the entire city to get running water. Like DOA, they toured constantly across North America, building an audience with what was reasonably melodic for hardcore. Fans and admirers included Billy Joe Armstrong of Green Day. And if you went to Europe, there was a pretty good chance that you would see people wearing SNFU gear. Their live performances were insane. Chi Pig developed a reputation as being one of the most energetic and athletic frontmen found anywhere in punk. The band first broke up in 1989, but then reunited in 1991 for almost 15 years. Then there was another reunion in 2007 that lasted until 2018. And through that whole period, Chi Pig was the only constant member. He worked with close to three dozen different musicians in the band. They never really got around to recording anything more than some demos and live performances for the first few years. Their debut album didn't appear until 1985 and was called And No One Else Wanted to Play. Here's a song, which is an 89-second sample. SNFU and She's Not on the Menu from their debut album in 1985. There were a total of eight SNFU albums, a couple of live albums, some EPs, and one compilation. And at one point, they were signed to Epitaph, the label that launched the careers of Bad Religion and The Offspring. SNFU would probably still be with us if Mr. Cheapig had not died on July 16, 2020, after being diagnosed with a serious medical problem in 2018. He knew the condition was fatal and spent his last months recording some solo material. When he died, he and SNFU were so revered that plans for a mural and a statue were immediately floated by the punk community in Edmonton. Finally, we're going to move to Portage La Prairie, Manitoba, a town of about 13,000 people 50 miles west of Winnipeg. That's the birthplace of Propagandi, a punk rock and skate punk band that was formed in 1986 very left-wing, sometimes anarchist, often vegan. They remain very socially conscious, taking aim at human rights violations, sexism, racism, capitalism, organized religion, the works. They've been aligned with American bands like NoFX and Fugazi, and they were once signed to Fat Mike's Fat Records punk label out of California. Their debut record appeared in 1993 and was called How to Clean Everything. You uh, might recognize this cover. Now, based out of Winnipeg, that's one of Canada's premier punk bands, Propagandi. And that's a list of 14 Canadian punk bands who not only helped establish punk rock in Canada back in the early days, but also had an influence on punk in the U.S. and even around the world. There are others that we could have mentioned. The Poles, the Furries, the Modernettes, the Mods, the Secrets, the Ugly. There were also small but important scenes in Victoria, Montreal, Calgary, Winnipeg, Ottawa, and in the Maritimes. For those who remember that period in the late 70s through to the middle 80s, it's a pretty wild time. And if you weren't around then, I encourage you to check out this part of Canadian music history. More programs like this are available as podcasts through the usual outlets. Just download and go. 
Music news and information on my website, a journal of musical things.com daily. Get the free daily newsletter too. We can connect through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and even TikTok. And email is encouraged. Drop me a line through alan at alancross.ca. Technical productions by Rob Johnston. We'll talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.